So love it or hate it, something that I think a lot of us have faced before is this experience where we need to create something really simple to automate a simple task. Now often that task could be simplified using something like a shell script. I think a shell script is great for a lot of different things. It gives you an easy way to automate things and it gives you a simple environment where you can test things on the command line, see how they work, and then if it all works, just put it together into a script. Now that's great in the short term, but in the long term, eventually these small scripts start to expand into something well beyond what you really want to be writing a shell script with. Eventually you start running into a lot of pain points where you have to worry about special quoting, you have to worry about handling things like a loop in shell scripts, which is not very friendly. Eventually things start to become unwieldy and you end up with a really tall file with a lot of different steps and it becomes really difficult to work with. Now while in theory you could just go ahead and port this entire thing over to another program, it'd be nice to start from a good base point where you could just write up a script in a language that I could also use for a larger program. And so this is where Common Lisp comes into the picture. I wanted to give you guys a great video that talks a bit about why Common Lisp is a great environment for such a use case as well as how you guys can get started using it as a scripting environment with something like Roswell. Anyways, let's get into it. Now the first example of a language that people would think to jump to as an alternative to this would be something like Python, which I think is a great language for scripting, but it does have the negative of the fact that you basically have to handle the different versioning, including other libraries, can be a huge pain in your project and you don't have a single binary, you have to keep it around as like a script. So Python might not be the best choice, especially if you want something that will be very easily portable to another system and includes alternative libraries that aren't in the core language. Now another alternative that I see a lot of people go for is something like the Go programming language. I think it has a lot to offer in the fact that it's very portable, it gives you a final executable which means that you can basically compile it and you can distribute it very easily, as well as not having to run a uh, interpreted language in general, it means you get like a performance increase if that matters to you. But the trade-off here is that Go doesn't really offer you that same command line experience of having a really quick way to test small sections of your code and have a quick feedback loop um, which makes sort of scripting environments very enjoyable and easy to work with, which is why people use Bash scripts for a lot of this stuff. Now, as I've said before, this interactive programming environment is actually one of the things that Common Lisp really shines at. And uh, this is obviously a really good use case for it because you want this interactive environment because you are kind of just experimenting, you're writing something really quick and you're not really thinking about it too much. So it's good to know that what you're writing is gonna work when you try it out. So while there are plenty of ways to do scripting sort of uh, programming in Common Lisp, probably the best option out there right now for most people is Roswell. You can kind of think of Roswell as both a scripting environment as well as a way to manage different Common Lisp implementations. If you don't know what I'm talking about here, don't really worry about it. We won't focus on that for this video. This video will be purely focused on the scripting portion of what Roswell offers. Now, if you guys are on Arch Linux, you can actually install it really easily by just doing sudo pacman s as well. And then this will allow you to install it. It's actually in the official repositories, but you can also install it from the actual officially released binaries. So this is the Roswell GitHub page, and you'll see there's a bunch of information here, and you'll see that it's actually available for Linux, FreeBSD, Mac OS, Windows, and much more. And they provide binaries that you guys can go ahead and give it a try. Now, once you have Roswell installed, you can go ahead and run ROS. And this will print out a bunch of help information as well as install a common Lisp implementation for you. Don't really worry about it too much. It's just going to go ahead and pull some stuff down from the internet for you. Then it will give you this information on all these different commands you can run. And as the help says, if you guys want to learn more about one of these topics, um, for example, init, which we'll be using in this video, then you can do ROS and then init, and it will give you this nice little man page interface. I have that disabled. It'll give you this nice little man page style interface. Anyways, now if you want to give that a try and kind of look through the man page on your own, that's great. I highly recommend it. But for now, we're going to go ahead and actually write our first script. So what we're going to do is we're going to run the command ROS init, and we're going to give it a name for our script. So we're going to call it BM for bookmark, because uh, we'll be converting a shell script into a Roswell script, I guess you could think of it as. Now we'll go ahead and run this and there we go so we have created a template so if we go ahead and open this file bm.ros we will get a really simple template roswell provides the ability to create users templates and this is just the default one i haven't really played with the template thing so i can't really guarantee how stable or how usable that is i would love to hear what you guys think down in the comments now probably the strangest thing you'll notice about this is this, this strange header section and basically what this is doing is it is calling a shell just your base system System shell and it is actually getting that to execute Roswell and execute the script. So if we did something really simple, let's just say print 
blue. And so say we do that and we went ahead and we ran the command dot slash bm dot raws, which is this file, as we just said before, and hit enter. It will be very slow and it will say hello, but then we can run it again. It should be a bit faster. But as you can see, there's quite a lot of overhead here. Now this overhead is obviously coming from starting up a whole nother shell and starting another process and loading a bunch of stuff just to read this file, compile it, and then run it. So obviously there's quite a bit of overhead, but as the file gets bigger, it's not as noticeable. And actually by the end of this video, I'll show you guys how to compile this into an executable, which speeds this up a lot. So keep that in mind for the rest of this. Now, as of right now, that workflow that I was just showing where you're running things from the command line, like I guess that's nice, but it kind of loses out on a lot of what I was hoping to achieve with having a more interactive workflow. For that reason is why we'll be using a actual uh, REPL for the rest of this. So we'll be using Sly, if you guys are familiar with my Sly video. So since we're using Roswell, we can actually go ahead and do Control U and then Alt X. And then this will actually allow us to execute a command. So I'll do Sly. And so executing Sly, it will actually prompt us to enter the name of the Lisp program that we'll be using. So in this case, since we're using Roswell, we'll use Ros run. All this does is it starts up a little REPL for you. And then if you do dash L, this tells it to load a file and we'll give it bm.ros. If I hit enter, just take a sec and there we go. Now what we'll do is we'll just go over here and we'll do control C and tilde. This will basically change the package that we're in to this guy. This is the automatically generated name of the package. Pretty random, doesn't really matter too much. But now this will give us access to the main function. And if we run ahead and run that, we'll see that it prints out hello. Now, alternatively, you could compile the entire file um, and just use whatever Lisp implementation you have and just assume it works. And to do that, you would just comment out this line, save. And you, uh, if I just did control C, control K, that will go ahead and compile the file. Now, if we didn't have that commented out and we saved it and did control C, control K, we would get a little error due to this guy. So that's just something to keep in mind. Uh, if you guys want to load this, you guys could also just do control C, control C, control C, control C on each of the forms, but obviously that gets a little old. Now, what I wanted to do to give you guys a good example of how to write a script was to actually port a script from a bash script to a Lisp file. And so this file right here is what we will be working with. Um, it's a very simple a script, but it gives us a really good basis for answering most of the questions that you'll have when it comes to porting a script from a bash script to Lisp. So I just realized that I actually never explained what the script does. So really quickly, I just wanted to go through it. Uh, basically, all it does is it determines the launcher that you're going to use. So that would basically be D menu for most people. And then it kind of determines your browser. This part I don't really need to cover because I actually don't use it anymore. And then all it is doing here is that basically it checks and sees if you have a bookmarks file. And then if it does, it will use that to select the URL to open in your browser. And if not, uh, it will just go ahead and search that with DuckDuckGo. So basically you can think of this as just a simple bookmark fuzzy finder using D menu. Hopefully that explains everything. You can actually run it. So if I just do duck and hit enter, it will open some random bookmark that I have for whatever reason, um, bookmarked. Now, the very first thing you'll notice is this little command line section right here, where we are basically getting an environmental variable and setting its value. We can actually go ahead and do that simply by doing UIOP get env, and then we will give it the name of the environmental variable. So this is how we can get the environmental variable, but we also need a way to set it. So we'll go ahead and store this in a def var, and we'll define this as a launcher. And so we'll do this guy. So we'll say or, so either this guy, and then default to this guy. So that takes care of this part. So something that I just realized that I actually didn't consider when I did this or statement was actually that this is using a uh, conditional thing. So basically if we have a display and set the launcher to this, um, if we have an existing launcher, use that. And if we do not have an existing launcher, use this. So what we would do instead is we could actually do cond. And this is basically kind of like a switch statement in a lot of other languages. So basically what I'm doing here is I'm doing something similar to a switch statement where I'm basically saying if there is no display environment variable, then set the launcher to FCF. If there is no preset launcher, then use D menu. And if there is both display and a preset launcher, then just use the launcher. Very simple. Now here we're setting the browser. Um, honestly, I don't really know if there's too much reason to follow this exactly because when I wrote this, um, I didn't really think all this through. So we'll port the important parts of this. So we'll do def var browser and we'll go ahead and set the browser to, if there's no display, then what we will do is we will set the 
browser to so we'll use xdg open if there oh sorry if there is a display then we'll just use the default browser environment variable so now basically we're saying if there is a display when i say display here it's actually just basically checking to make sure that i'm using uh, something other than a tty so if i'm in a tty fcf rather than d menu because there won't be um, any way to display d menu um, and then same thing with if i'm in a normal x11 environment then i can just use my normal browser but if not then use xdg dash open this is mostly for termux this is a little unnecessary honestly both of these are kind of a little unnecessary if you guys don't ever use termux so basically what we have here is the choice like selection situation so what we'll do is we'll define a function and we'll call this picker because uh, i can't think of something better and we'll do a bm dash file and so this will be the actual path to the file oh and something i forgot to do really quickly is just put uh stars around this um this is just a common practice to basically say that it's a global variable. Uh, global variables are a bit special in common Lisp, so that's the only reason I mention it. So what we'll do next is we'll need to check and see if this file exists. So we'll do if this guy, so we'll do uiop file dash exists exists p uh, if you guys are wondering where this uiop thing is coming from this is actually a package which comes with quick lisp um, it's pretty much everywhere if you guys ever use asdf which is basically um, the build system that's used all over the lisp community then this is always available it's basically a uh, package that has a lot of what you'll use for scripting so that's kind of the reason that i'm just using it offhand so now we're just saying if this file exists then what are we going to do well we're going to want to copy this sort of idea so what we'll do is we will basically we'll have to run the command so we'll do with dash file with open file and so this allows us to actually open up a file and we'll do uh we'll call the or uh, we'll call this stream which is basically what we're taking the contents of that file and putting it into we'll call that in and we'll just give the uh bm dash file um, and this gives us a really simple way to uh, access the contents of that file now for now we will just uh with file open let's just go ahead and just actually what we'll do for now is we'll just read um, and then we'll give it the in and it looks like that compiled just fine uh, this must be an old thing um, now when we do picker let's go ahead and give it a file so we'll do hash p and then in quotes this is just kind of how you do a file path in a common lisp and for now we'll just use home dot config uh, bookmarks all right Ooh, and we have hit our debugger. That is not good. And we'll go ahead and just change this. Um, this was completely my fault. I meant to do read line, read line. There we go. Now, if we compile that again and run it, there we go. Now we are getting a line. So next up, we'll need to run the command. So we'll use UIOP and we'll do run program. All right, now this gives you a uh, really simple way of being able to execute a program. In fact, if we go to the REPL, let's do UIOP run program and we'll just do ls right and we hit enter and we'll see oh it doesn't give us anything but it tells us that it executed properly now if we actually wanted to get the output we would do colon output string there we go uh, and there we go now we get the output as a nice little string this is kind of usually what you end up doing obviously it gives us quite a lot of output about 969 files so this is kind of what we will want to do here so what we will do is we will run the command launcher uh, what we'll do instead is we will actually concatenate these strings. So luckily UIOP once again to the rescue with a string R cat. Uh, this is just a simplified way to concatenate strings. Obviously Lisp has a built-in way. It's just a bit more verbose and this is just a tiny bit shorter. And so for those of you guys that are wondering like why are you concatenating this, um, it's really just because the launchers that I have set up are basically all expecting a prompt. So I'm just giving it a prompt right here and then this will all these both these strings will be concatenated in fact right now if i went ahead and did uh put the actual proper stars around it so if i did that and then i evaluated that we would see okay it is going to give us the right output obviously this isn't the end of it because we still need to be able to tell it how to take this so we will do input right and that will be the in so that will be our file right here and then we need the output as string that seems right let's compile that we want to do picker and we want to give it the path all right so we got the path here let's go ahead and run it 
and it's giving us, oh, look, our picker is working. We are able to select stuff. Let's go ahead and just select the first entry. And it gave us back to us as a string, which is perfect. So right here, here's our string. If you guys are wondering what these other outputs are, this is the exit code and this is the actual error output. Um, so no error output was given to us. Now, if we for whatever reason wanted to actually collect the other output, then we would actually wrap this in a multi multiple value bind. And then we would give it the vars, which would be put error exit. And then we would just, if we only wanted the uh, exit, then we would just do exit. And then let's compile that. Oop, did I make a mistake? I accidentally um, misplaced the exit. There you go. Now it's all working properly. So if we compile that and go ahead and run our picker again, and we select that, and we select that, we will get a zero because that is the exit code. Um, so that's pretty cool, but we luckily don't really need that because all we need to do is ensure that this actually um, finished successfully. So once again, if we run this and I, if I go down here and I hit control G, then it actually uh, signals the debugger. So it'll give us that little interface that we saw before. If I switch to DB, they will actually tell us like there was an exit code of one. So we can go ahead and handle that how we want to. Uh, we'll go ahead and abort. So that's kind of how we can handle this error case of if, for example, our program was canceled unexpectedly. So now in our main, we'll go ahead and call picker and we will give it the path. So hash p quotes dot config slash bookmarks. And so now we have defined that in our main. Now, in case of this program actually exiting unexpectedly, we should probably handle that. So what we'll do is we'll do handler case and the error. And basically we're saying if there's an error coming out of this command right here, what we'll do, we don't really need what kind of an error it was. Actually, you know what, let's do C. And then luckily, once again, UIOP to the rescue, we will do UIOP die. And then we will exit with a code of one and a C. Uh, now this should give us a way to cancel this. So now let's go ahead and give this a try. Let's do main right down here. We will cancel and there you go. Okay, so it did uh, kill our shell. So what you can do instead is you can do a hash plus and then slink and then we will go ahead and restart our REPL. There you go and I've just restarted my REPL and now what we'll do is we'll just add this little section right here which basically says if slink is not running which is the back end for the sly REPL then go ahead and die. Otherwise, uh, don't die, just kind of continue. And that's kind of uh, just what we'll do for now. We could probably come up with a better solution in the future. All right, and so now we are on to the very last requirement. We'll just put this in a let, um, and this is basically a way to just create a simple variable, and we'll store this in a choice like we did before. And so basically we're saying what the choice was that we picked will be stored in here, and now we'll go ahead and access that. So we'll do another cond, and then by default, what we will do is we will just uh, do the same thing, except instead of splitting things up, we will just pass it the choice. Um, now, obviously, this is a bit rough, so we'll actually uh, split this up. So we'll do create a new function right here really quickly, def fun. So this will take a bookmark. It will get the URL, and we'll just change this to BM. Okay, and then this guy, there we go. So that's a bit nicer. Now let's compile that. And I finally realized what the actual source of my problem was. It's because I misspelled browser. That was a bit embarrassing, but uh, now we all know. So now if I go ahead and run that, we should get this little prompt down here. Hit enter. There we go. And now all is working properly. So now that we have our script right here, we probably want to actually uh, build it and run it. So once again, like I said before, we could just do dot slash bm dot raws and hit enter. And then we could use this, but as you can see, there was a bit of a delay. So to remove this over overhead that we're seeing here. We'll do raws really quickly. Let's just put this at the top so you guys can see it and make it a little bit bigger. Raws build and then bm raws and hit enter. And this will take a little while and it's just creating an executable that we can go ahead and run. So now if we do dot slash bm enter, we'll see that it is a much faster uh, transition time. Uh, so quick correction, something that I just noticed is that if you do the actual die here, it seems to actually uh, break the Lisp image. So I do not recommend doing what I just did. Um, change that to a quit. Used, uh, that's probably fine. If we execute that and we actually quit it this time, there we go. It actually uh, doesn't give us this error. Before we were getting, uh, I was getting this memory fault error. Uh, and I think that's just an issue of how I was using the die uh, function. So there we go. In the end, running this raws build uh, gives us this nice executable. 
And if we went and hit two, we could go ahead and share this uh, executable around. In addition, there are some tricks to optimize it and make it a bit faster um, at the cost of taking up more space if you wanted that. Really, I don't recommend this for very, very small scripts. In reality, very, very small scripts aren't really what it's very good at. It still has its own overhead of starting up the Lisp image, especially because as you can see here, it's actually uh, compressing everything down to save a lot of space. Time that it takes to decompress that will add some overhead. And there you guys go. That is the basis for how you guys can make a simple script with common Lisp. Now there are some gotchas I should mention. For example, handling interrupts like control C will actually open up the debugger. And a lot of times in the final executable, you don't want that. So that can be kind of a pain. The way that you handle that is very similar to how we handled the canceled command. I'll go ahead and put a link down in the description where you guys can take a look at how that can be resolved, as well as some links down to how you guys can learn a bit more about how this works. As you guys can see, UIOP, that package package is super useful for scripting and general stuff like that. So I highly recommend you guys take a look at it. It offers pretty much everything you could need. Now there's a lot more that Roswell brings to the table, such as being able to use it for package management, um, managing of different common Lisp implementations. I won't really talk about that in this video, but I will definitely cover it in a future video. If you guys are interested in that, be sure to let me know down in the comments what you want to learn about Roswell, or if you wanted to learn about other opportunities, there's a lot of different um, options out there when it comes to to using common list for different things. Sometimes Roswell isn't the perfect pick, um, but a lot of times I tend to use it. Um, anyways, I just wanted to say thanks to you guys for watching and a big shout out to my supporters, Connor G, Russell Willis, and Miguel. Those are my Patreon supporters. Thank you very much for supporting me. In addition, I wanted to thank my GitHub sponsor supporters, Tall Guy Jenks, Platinus, and Carr. Anyways, guys, I hope you enjoyed this video and I hope you guys enjoyed learning about Roswell and other common list tools out there in the world. Thanks, and I'll see you next time.